Father, we thank you. We thank you for giving us this time this morning to draw our attention away from this world and to focus on you, the gift of your Son, sending Jesus to become flesh, to become one of us, to die for us, to live for us, and now to live in us. And we ask that your presence, your spirit will be here. Send angels and your Holy Spirit to open our minds as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, did you all get to... Um Stay up last night long enough? Well, I was going to stay over here by a, just in case. <laughs> okay. I don't know how well you can see that. We couldn't see it at all outside. Clouds all over the place. We had a little glimmer of hope early on. There were some bright areas, and we thought, oh, and there's a star. Oh, if it'll just open up. <laughs> it didn't work. So we went inside and uh, got on the internet, and we found somebody in Lubbock, Texas, who had 15, no, oh, at the end, 16,000 people <laughs> online watching the eclipse. Because none of the others, the NASA website was froze up. <laughs> it wouldn't work at all. And uh, I don't know who this guy was, but it was working, and we watched the whole thing pretty much. I, I, it got about, what was it, 15 minutes past maximum, and I said, okay, that's enough. And then I thought, hey, I can screenshot this. So I did. So this is at, almost at the end of the eclipse. But it was pretty red all the way through, and it lasted a long time. The world got to see a red moon for a long time. Now, back in April when we were out in Terabella, I got up 5 o'clock in the morning and saw one of these. But it only lasted about 10 minutes. And, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't this red. Anyway, of course, he magnified this, and, and he was adjusting it and get the lighting just right. Well, uh, I thought we shared uh, something about the moon and the sun and the earth with folks last Wednesday night. We were, our attention was on the Day of Atonement then, and so... Just real quickly, I'd like to share this with the rest of you who weren't there and those on the Internet. There was something that I just learned recently, and it seems like it applies to us this year. There's a connection between 1844 and 2015 uh, that I, didn't, I wasn't aware of. And I had made all these connections between 1844 and, and 31 A.D., and... 34 A.D. and 1798, and I, those things connect really neat with, uh, you know, Jubilee intervals. Well, there's another connection between 1844 and 2015. It has to do with the sun. There's the sun. And the orbit of the earth around the sun. There's the earth. And the orbit of the moon around the earth. And there's the moon. Now, I've positioned it. We're going to start out with a full moon because that's where the moon would have to be to be a full moon, right? Opposite the, uh, in line with the sun, but opposite uh, so that the uh, moon will get all the light of the sun. So that's a full moon. And that's the position it was last night when we had an eclipse because the earth would be in the way. The earth is turning on its axis 1,000 miles per hour. Yeah, at the equator. You've got to hang on or you get thrown off. We're on the move. <laughs> so if we start, listen, we're going to use this as our starting point. And there is an interesting relationship between the orbits of the moon and the orbits of the sun, uh, the earth around the sun, that has to do with a multiple of 19 years. Now, if we go around the, uh, uh, as we go around the sun in one year's uh, orbit, orbit one month later, when the moon is full again, it's going to be about there because it's opposite the sun again. And another month, it's about there. 
and another month about there, and another month, and a year, after we've gone around the month, uh, uh, 12 full moons, we're 11 days short of the solar year, being back where we started from, where the Earth started from. So it's, that's the reason why many of the calendars, like the Hebrew, or the Jewish calendar, has to add an extra month every once in a while. Because 11 days, you know, next year it's going to be 22 days, and then you got 33 days. and So, oh, you got to put a month in there to get back in sequence with the sun. Now, let's uh, look at something else. With, if we come back to where the earth is exactly, the moon won't be in the same place it was when we started out. Instead of being there, it'll be somewhere over about there because it's 11 days later. Well, what happens? If we go around the Earth, around the Sun, one year, that's where we end up. If we go around the Sun the second year, we're over there somewhere, and then the third year, and the fourth year, and the fifth year, sixth year, seventh year. It turns out that about 18, 19 years, we're right back where we started from. Within just a couple of hours, it's pretty accurate. And when you think about all the hours in a year, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty close. In fact, this has been known for a long time, like 400 BC, and probably before that, but this guy gets the name for it, uh, some Greek astronomer named Meton, and he said, every 19 years, that moon's right back where it started from, and uh, we can use this in designing calendars. So they did, and it's called the Metonic Cycle. So if we uh, look at, did I do that too fast? Uh, 19 solar years is 235 lunar orbits around the Earth. And it happens to be, uh, since there are 365.242199 days in a solar year, that's how many days it takes to go clear around the sun for the Earth, in 235 no, in 19 years, that ends up being 6,939 days, point six zero one seven eight one days. Well, in 235 lunar cycles, which each one is 29.53025 days, that ends up being 6,939. See how close that is? Six, zero, eight. Okay, what's the difference? About seven thousandths of a day. I don't know, that seems like less than two hours, an hour or two. I don't know, that's pretty close. So that was uh, really interesting to me, and I thought, wow, are we doing this again? Are we in a loop? I think this thing's in here twice. Uh, scoot me ahead there. <laughs> How did I get back there? Uh, go clear down to, um, I can't see what number it is, but you move the cursor and I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> Anybody up there? They're all gone. No. Oh, okay. No. I said, uh, get me a letter. Uh, one, two, three, four, five slides from the end of that line. Starting from the line. No, starting from the end of the line. Go back five slides. Oh, man, right. Ah, oh, dear. Don't slide the slide. Just put your cursor on and select the one. <clears throat> it's almost right under the middle now. Let's select the one under the middle. That's good. Let's do the one under the middle. Nope, next one. Next one. To the, ri to the right, to the right, to the right. There, do that one. Okay, there's the metonic cycle. Oh, we did all that. Okay. Okay, there's where we want to get. I don't know how that got in there twice. Okay, so in 1844, there have been exactly nine of these metonic cycles to this year because nine times 19 is 171 years, and that's the difference between 1844 and 2015. Well, for your edification, I don't know what it means. Uh, but the conditions, some have suggested that the conditions in 1844 are very, very, very similar to what they are this time. Now, 
we saw this blood moon, and it seems like it's real close to tabernacles. Some pay, say tabernacles is Tuesday. Some say it's today. Um, we saw the blood moon last night. When is, you know, it should be today. It should be today. Then um, that would really coincide, wouldn't it? Right on. So I don't want to focus on that. Our focus today is on Jesus. All these things point us to him. So if these things happen in the world, people say, what's happening? Let's go back and study prophecy. I think we're at the end of time. Well, we are. But who's going to get us through the end of time? <laughs> only, only through our Savior leading us. He's going to lead us through the wilderness. He's going to lead us out of Egypt. And we're going to be delivered through his power. So keep our eyes on him. Friday night we talked about when the word became flesh. And today I'd like to look a little bit more. We touched on why the word became flesh. And why was that? The very first text we, we offered. That he might die for us. Looking unto Jesus, well, uh, actually it's Hebrews 2, verse 9, looking unto Jesus, but we see Jesus, looking unto Jesus is chapter 12, we, but we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels. Who else is made a little lower than the angels? Yes. That's quoting Psalm chapter 8, where David first said, then Paul picks it up in Hebrews. We are made lower than the angels. And Jesus came even not down to the angels. Where he, is he the uh, commander of the heavenly host? Yes. Michael the archangel? Yes. But he's not an angel. And yet, he related with the angels in their form so they could understand what it's like to obey and submit and honor the Father. And then he came even further down to our level, lower than the angels, a little lower than the angels. Okay, that he came to die, that he might taste death for every man. That's what that text says. Now, that's why the word came, became flesh. But there's more than why he, there's more reasons why he became flesh. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and we famous text, what? Know ye not? Paul says this a bunch of times, and this is one of them. What? Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. So where does this, um, where does the Holy Ghost come from? God, where is the Holy Ghost going to be? In you. Verse 20, for you are bought with a price. Who bought us? Yes. When Jesus cleansed the temple in Jerusalem, he said, this is my Father's house. And when he comes to dwell in us, what does he say? This is my house. Did he create us? He says, he created man in the beginning. Breathed into him the breath of life. What is that breath of life? Jesus did something in the upper room right before he left. And they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. He breathed on the disciples. Oh, no, actually, it was in chapter 20. It was after his resurrection. Came back appeared to the disciples in the upper room, John chapter 20. He breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. So we are the temples. And if, uh, oh, this is an interesting text. 2 Corinthians. Now that was 1 Corinthians 6, 19. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6. 
And it's not 19, but almost. <laughs> Verse 17. Well, let's, 16. Let's start with 16. We'll get a running start. Oh, Robin's not here. <laughs> what agreement has the temple of God with idols? I hope our temples don't have any agreement with idols, right? For you are the temple of the living God. Here he says, he's saying it again. For God has said, and he's quoting Leviticus 26, 12, I will dwell in them. He's going to dwell in us and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate. Now, we hear that text a lot. The, verse 17 says, The Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, I will receive you and be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. So, if we are the temple of God, and He's going to dwell in us, I will dwell in you, and walk in you. <laughs> Which reminds me of Ezekiel 26. Is it 26? 36, 26. 36, 26. He will make us walk. He's going to walk with us and make us walk with Him. Right? I will walk in you, and I will make you walk in my judgments and statutes and commandments. Romans 8, 9. You are in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, here's the same thought again. The Spirit of God is going to dwell in us. In verse 10, the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Who raised Jesus from the dead? So the Spirit of the Father will dwell in you that he may also dwell in you. Did Jesus say that? Matthew 10, verse 20. Many times I meet people that think that when they die, there's some spirit floating around representing them. Yeah. But I tell them, no, we're just like an automobile, but it's got gasoline in it, and it has life that goes and comes, but... When it runs out of gas, it's dead and quiet. And that's right. And so the same with the breath of life. God breathed into the breath of life on Adam. Yes. And he Came. A living soul. He wasn't given a soul. When that breath is gone, <laughs> there's nothing. Yes, yes. So the spirit of him who raised Jesus is going to be dwelling in you. And Jesus said, the spirit of your father who is in you, Matthew 10, verse 20, will give you the words to speak, just as he gives me the words to speak, right? Now, I, there's a text. You know all the 316 text. John 316? 2 Timothy 316? <clears throat> oh, that's First Timothy 316. 2 Timothy 316. Yeah, all scripture is given by some inspiration. Okay, actually it's 15 and 16. Uh, Colossians 316. Here's another 316 text. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. I wrote a little song for this. Um, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Get breath there. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you. So the the Spirit of God is going to dwell in you. You're a temple. And the Word of Christ is going to dwell in you. And John 5, 15, 70. Now, here's where John, uh, Jesus was walking through the, uh, on the way to Garden of Gethsemane, and they went by some grape vines. And he said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And in verse 15, Seven, he says, if my word abide in you, you shall ask what you want, and it will be done. If my word abide in you, the word of Christ abides in you. And then uh, 1 John 2, 24. Let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. What do you hear? The word. The word. And what is it that abides in you? We've just said the word. He says it back in uh, chapter 1, in the beginning, which we heard, <laughs> that word of life, 
and they touched and they heard and they saw and uh, they were with him personally. So they, this was very real. And what is the word of life? Let's look at verse 2. That eternal life which was with the Father. That's the word of life. The word that was in the beginning with God is that eternal life which was with the Father. Of course, that goes right along with verse 4 of John 1, 4. In him was life. So he is that eternal life that was with the Father. And then in verse 3, that's why our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says his word is going to abide in us. He is going to abide in... Oh, did Jesus say he's going to abide in us? Where did he say that? Uh, let's go look in here. Oh, uh, uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> what? Yes, and abide. We're connected. Yes, and Ellen White says that that sap, she uses the word sap, that Holy Spirit that flows through Christ into us is what is that living connection, that communion that, keep, that gives us life and that we might bear much fruit. Well, how do we get this spirit? He that keeps his commandments dwells in him and he in him. He abides in us by his spirit which he has given us. What is the spirit that God has given us? Yes, Galatians. You have a text for that? Can you back that up, sister, with a text? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Now, what text would she use? Galatians 4, 6. Let's look at that. God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Why does that Spirit cry, Father? It's the Spirit of the Son. Yes. That's right. Abba is the center. It's the core of Sabbath. Sabbath. Abba is right in, right in the Sabbath. Try the spirits. Now, how can we know whether we've got the right spirit? Do some people have the wrong spirit? There is one who wants to hijack our temples. You can read about it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He's going to sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. You're all familiar with that text. Who's that? Satan wants to be in the temple, our temples. So how do we know whether we have the right spirit coming into our temple? John tells us in 1 John chapter 4 verse 1, Try the spirits by their fruits, yes. And uh, the spirit, the test he gives here in chapter 4 is an interesting one. And it's the focus. I'm going to tie it back to our theme uh, this week. He says, try the spirits, whether they are God. Let's read it here, chapter 4. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, what do false prophets have to do with the spirits? Do false prophets have... True spirits or false spirits? They got false spirits. You got false prophets and false spirits. Hereby, verse 2, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. The Spirit of God confesses that Jesus is come in the flesh. Now notice that he said, is come in the flesh. When was John writing this? perhaps 50, 60 years after Jesus had already died. Probably more than 50 years. He sh should have said, the Spirit of God confessed, that Jesus has come in the flesh, if he's talking about his incarnation at his birth, the time he lived on earth. What, what is he talking about? Jesus is come in the flesh. Whose flesh? Our flesh. 
Now, that means there is a spirit that comes from God that says Jesus is going to dwell in your flesh, in your body temple. There are other spirits who say there's someone else that's going to dwell in your spirit, in your temple. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist. Yeah. Oh, I really ought to expand on that. I had that out here. Um, Jesus told the woman at the well, you know not what you worship. How many people know not what they worship today? Are they worshiping some, the some other, the unknown God, yes. <laughs> unknown to them. And um, he told Nicodemus, you're a master of Israel and you know not these things. There's a lot of people who are uninformed at Jesus' day and there are still today. Jesus um, spoke very plainly to his disciples in the upper room. He said, I will come to you. John 14, 18. And then he got even more precise and he said two verses later, I will be in you. And in verse 23, after one of the disciples said, how are you going to do that? You know, somebody asked um, Ellen White the same question once. And uh, what did she say? It is not important for you to know how the Spirit operates, the nature of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is telling us who is going to dwell in us. Now, is that important? Yes. <laughs> yes. You want to know, what is that song? For I know whom I have believed. Yeah, we want to know who is dwelling in us, don't we? And it better be the right spirit. I and my Father will come and abide with you, he says in verse 23. In answer to his question, how are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? He didn't answer that question. He just said again, it's going to be me and my Father. If a man loves me, and keeps my word that is abiding in him, he will keep my commandments. And I will love him. And my father will love him. And we will come and make our abode with him. Well, when that happens, and he comes into our temple, what's going to be the result? <laughs> yeah, what happened when Jesus went into the temple? He cleaned it for one thing, yeah. He got all the riffraff and the junk and the trash and then he got the money out of the, <laughs> the, money out of the temple. And Yes. And the Spirit ought to dwell in you. Yes. If any man defile this temple, him shall God destroy. destroy. For the temple of God is if, holy, which temple ye are. Right. And if you allow your temple to be defiled and you don't let him clean it, you're going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Right. So what's the solution here? Let Jesus come into your heart and into your mind and into your life and... Let him clean out all the <laughs> trash. Clean that temple. Let him do it. Who else can do it? Can one of these other spirits that wants to be in the temple, can they clean the temple? No, what do they do? What did Jesus say they would do? They would bring seven others worse than them. And Oh, no. You better have the right spirit cleaning our temples, right? <laughs> Heart. 
into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. In today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. You, you see, you get a song for truth as well. Oh, these are wonderful themes, aren't they? And when that happens, what happens? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Oh, not, not yet. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ... Now, what did Jesus say? He says... Um, To Philip, John, yeah, John, I'm going to get there, I'm going to preface it here. John 14, verse 9, he said to Philip, don't, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? He always said that the same, that together. I am in the Father and the Father in me. In John 17, when he's praying to his Father, Father, it is my, yeah. I will that we, they be in us and I in you and you in them and we, we, <laughs> everybody's inside of everybody else, sounds like, when you read that. And he says, if any man be in Christ. So if we are in Christ, what else is happening? You're a new creature. He is in us and we are a new creature. Now this is a, this is an interesting thought. Is there going to be a new creation in the universe? A new class of beings that had not existed before? In a sense. But in a reality as well. That's right. And greater. Yes. Oh, look at the, this. Is, this is what... Ellen White says, Christ Object Lessons, to human beings striving, striving for conformity to the divine image. Is that what we should be doing? Right now, this is time for us to conform to the image of Christ, the divine image. Just as he, was he conformed to the image of his father? How conformed was he? Express image of his father. Yes. The exact image of his father. And that's what we should be doing. There is imparted, if this happens, if we conform to the divine image, there is imparted an outlay of heaven's treasure. What is heaven's treasure? What did the father pour out? In the gift? All heaven in that one gift, she says. The outlay of heaven's treasure and excellency of power. Who's the power of God? 1 Corinthians 1, 24. Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. An excellency of power that will place them who? Human beings who have conformed to the divine image. It will place them higher than even the angels who have never fallen. How can that be possible? It reminded me of a song... We were trying to remember the words this morning. You're going to have to help me again. Holy, holy is what the angels sing. And I intend to help them make the courts of heaven ring. But when I sing redemption story... They will fold their wings. How many wings? Some of them have six wings. Two to cover their face. Two to cover their feet. I guess two to fly with. <laughs> For they will never know the joy that our salvation brings. Now you go up, I'll go down. That's right. Angels desire to look, Peter tells us. First Peter 1, 11, 12, 
12, 13, somewhere down there. Look it up. You'll find it. First, two, first Peter 1. I, if I can get the chapter, I'll find the verse. Uh, <clears throat> I can't help but think of the story of the prodigal son. He went and stayed home and never had any great experience. Yes. But he went away, went away and sinned. When he came back, he learned something about life that his brother didn't know. And how much more did he love his father than the other brother? <laughs> What did Jesus say to Simon? He learned to appreciate and love his father. Yes, and he was forgiven. I think of people like Doug Baxter. I mean, look what he went through. He has an experience that you and I have never had. <laughs> yeah, not the same, but we all have an experience. We will all have a story. We do have a story, and we better be telling our story right now to all who will listen because that's that's greater impact than reading any... Now, they will be more interested to read what the Scripture has done, and you tell them what reading the Bible has done for you. And we all have stories to tell, so we, we can... This can be our experience, higher than the angels who have never fallen. But we must be careful. If we think that uh, we have already made it and we're better than the angels... Watch out. Be cautious. She also said, now I never heard of this little book, A Solemn Appeal. I think it was um, made to Battle Creek. I should have looked up the preface there to see, uh, the introduction to see where this was exactly. But she says, the majesty of heaven was ever found working to help those who most needed help. Well, that was true, wasn't it? And just as you said, Calvin, Dr. Dance, you... Never charge anything for people. You help them. If they are impressed to help you in your further ministry, then God would work through them. But he would help those who needed most help. May the example of Christ put to shame the excuses of that class who are so attracted to their poor self, <laughs> to their self, that they consider it beneath their refined state and their high calling to help the most helpless. Such have taken a position higher than their Lord. Now, do you want to be higher than Jesus? What are we going to do when we get there on the sea of glass? <laughs> well, no, he's going to get the crown. We're going to throw the crowns at his feet, right? Why did the word become flesh? Yeah, so that he could die for us. Romans 5.10 tells us that. But it also says much more. Are we saved by his life? He came to become one of us to show us how. What we should do. How we should treat others how we should devote our lives to the Father's will. He said, I, have, I come not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Are we sent? We're all apostles, aren't we? A sent, we're sent. What did Jesus say? As the Father has sent me, so send I you. The life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. That's the last part of our theme song. Where is that from? 411. <laughs> that highway down there that you have to cross. 411. 2 Corinthians. Not 1st, 2 Corinthians. Okay. Oh, I've got 1 Corinthians here. Is that right? I thought it was 2 Corinthians. Come on, I'm right here. 2 Corinthians 411. It's 2 four, Corinthians. I typed it wrong here. Did I say that in here too? <laughs> there it is. Oh, we're going to get to that. Okay. Verse 14, knowing that he which raised up Jesus from the dead shall raise us also by Jesus. The life of Jesus, not the human life, but his divine life is the spirit life of Jesus. There's a physical and a spiritual. We have a spirit 
and we have a body. Now what happens when we die? It goes back to God for safekeeping. He's going to put it away in his backup storage uh, so that we can reboot our new hardware when he resurrects us. Or if we're lucky enough to get a hardware upgrade in vivo, Yes. Somehow God is going to uh, yeah. preserve that yes. movement, spirit, attitude, voice, and everything. Yep, yep. We have the same thing we will understand and see and know each other. We know how that works these days, don't we? Because we use these little things. And they save, this has got 64 gigabytes. I got another one that's 128 back at home. Uh, that's a lot of, a lot of information. We got even more than that. <laughs> and, us, and he's going to save it all. He's going to back it all up. Romans 8, verse 2. Uh, I want to look at this just for a couple of moments here and we'll be done. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, here's the physical and the spiritual. The law of sin is spiritual. The law of death is physical. Now, you can have spiritual death. You can have a physical death as well. <laughs> but um, I, I can see how these will work in both ways. Now, John in John 6, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are so what is the spirit somehow it's connected with life I think they're related in some way when Jesus when he breathed into him the breath of life that word breath is the same word we use for spirit and in Romans 8:10, the spirit is life because of righteousness so the Spirit is life, we're told here. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, the Spirit gives life. I think we all agree to that. Galatians 6, 8, if we sow to the Spirit, shall we also of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So the Spirit and life related. Revelation 11, 11, the spirit of life from God entered into them. This is talking about the two witnesses who were slain in the streets of that city, which is spiritual Egypt and Sodom, where our Lord was crucified. But at the end of three and a half days, the spirit of life from God enters into them, and they stand up on their feet, and all of them, <gasps> well, we're not going to go into what all that means and everything, but the spirit of life from God uh, gives them life. And a Desire of Ages, page 21. And uh, Wayne, you mentioned this Sabbath morning, that, uh, the, other, the other day uh, when you were speaking, that through the Son, the Father's life flows out to all the universe, to every living creature in the universe. And then praise and adoration and a tide of beneficence flows back through the sun to the great source of all. Who's that? The Father. The Father's life flows out through Jesus, and that life comes back from us to Je through Jesus to the Father. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So he's the channel out, and he's the channel in. We want to get that life from Jesus and we want to get back to the Father. He says, I am the way. Now, what, when he said, I am the way, what had he just said before that? He'd just been talking about, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I will come again, receive you unto myself. Where I am, here you may be also. And he says, you, no, that, Philip asked that at, after Jesus said, uh, you know the way. 
And you, let's read it. It's so interesting the way this, uh, he says, I will come and receive you unto myself. And whether, where I go, you know. And the way, you know. And that's when Thomas says, we don't know where you're going and we don't know how, uh, know the way. Uh, help us here. What do you, he was being honest. It went over his head, right? Is that what we say? He didn't connect. And that's when Jesus had to say, I am the way. And where am I going? My father. Look, he, he lives in me. And if you, I'm going to take you. What, did the, what does the bride do? I mean, the, the bridegroom. <laughs> He comes and gets the bride from her house and takes him to his father's house. And so uh, this is all, all related language. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's... Uh, it's this law of the spirit of life in Christ that brings deliverance from sin and victory over it. That's the spiritual aspect where we once were weak and had failure. Now we have victory and strength through Jesus. It's the law of the spirit of life that brings life where there once was death. Now we have everlasting life because that life is in his son. In Revelation 22, 17, the Spirit and the Bride make an invitation. They're sending out invitations to the wedding feast. The Spirit and the Bride. Who sends out the wedding invitations? Who? The Bride, the bride and the Bride and the Groom. They send out the invitations. Okay. Take the water of life freely. What did Jesus say? He who is the great day, the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles, he who is thirsty, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me. And as it says in the scripture, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What did he say to the woman at the well? If you knew who you were talking to, who it was, you would say unto him, give me to drink. I asked you for a drink, but if you knew who was talking to you, you would ask him, and he would say, he would give unto you living water that shall be a spring of water flowing out into everlasting life. What did she say? Give me this water. That's what I want. Spirit and the bride. Why the lamb and the bride? This is the marriage supper of the bride, of the lamb, after all. This is the marriage supper of the lamb. Because the lamb has the seven spirits of God. Revelation 3, verse 1, 5, verse 6. He has all the spirit of his father, doesn't he? John chapter 3, verse 34. The father loves the son, has given all things into his hand. That's verse 35. Verse 34 says, For... God has not given by measure the Spirit unto him. What does that mean? That's a double negative. He has not. He has given it to him without measure, unlimited, infinite. It is his Spirit that now is to dwell in his bride. They become one Spirit. There's going to be a new creation. Now that, that spirit can begin right now. That's why Ellen White says heaven can, be, can begin right now on earth. We can experience heaven on earth now because the same spirit that we will have there can be in us now. And that's what we want. That the life of Christ might be manifest in our mortal flesh. Let's pray.
Once again, Father, we thank you for your great gift in giving us Jesus and through him, your spirit and eternal life, that eternal life which was with you in the beginning. We can't thank you enough. Every, every opportunity we have, we want to sing your praises and share with the world the wonderful good news that you have made provision in your house for us. You have made provision to clean our houses that you may dwell in us now. That is our prayer this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.